whom we serve. Taken, um, taken from 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 to 2, and Luke chapter 10, verses 33 to 35. Pastor Chris. Okay. Okay. I'm unmuted. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, just, uh, just to let you know, we have kind of a restless dog here this morning. <laughs> so you might, she probably won't bark, but you may hear her moan. <laughs> she often moans when she wants attention. So that's just Taffy. Just ignore her. Um, so good to be with you all. Um, I, I hope you're remembering. I know it's it can be a little disjointed month to month, um, and I'm actually what a week later this month. Um, last month we talked about why we serve, and today I wanted to talk about who we serve, um, particularly by using the cave of Adullam as uh, a template for us. Um, you know, what we're really talking about is how we communicate the whole gospel. The whole gospel affects all areas of life, but particularly is concerned with issues of justice and equality and respect. Um, and this passage from James, you know, just really stands out in terms of this whole focus of being concerned about others. Um, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that face save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So, you know, here James is saying, um, if we truly love the Lord, we're going to love others. We're going to care about others uh, and their needs. Um, we talked a couple months back about the having the outward look and that we're not to just be navel gazing and looking at ourselves, but looking outward, looking toward uh, others. Um, so, you know, who exactly is it that we should we should be outward looking to? Um, Isaiah 58, we've looked at before, but let me just run through it again. This whole chapter is uh, it's really kind of hard to read in a way. It, it, it's very convicting. Um, Isaiah 58, 6, starting in verse 6 says, Is this not the fast which I choose? This is God speaking. To loosen the bonds of wickedness. So the context is God is saying, the people of Israel are saying, how come God's not answering us? You know, we're, we're praying, we're, we're fasting, we're offering sacrifices, and God is saying, yeah, all that religious show is only that. It's just a show. Um, and I, I want to see that your faith in me actually affects how you think, how you behave, and how you treat others. So he says, isn't this the fast that I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bonds, the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out. Then your light will break out if you do these kinds of things, um, like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and He will say, "Here I am." If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the, the afflicted. Then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. And he goes on to say, you'll, you'll be blessed if you care about those uh, who are in need. So, um, you know, we're told uh, to care for these people. So we, I want to ask a little more specifically today, who are those for whom we're to loosen their, the bonds of wickedness? Who is it that needs us to undo the bands that yoke them? Who are the oppressed that we should set free? With whom are we to divide our bread? Who are the homeless poor and the naked that we should house and cover them? 
um, who, who are those that we point the finger at and speak ill of and we should stop doing that? Um, who are the hungry and afflicted to whom we should give ourselves? And I'd like us to look at, at this, just this little incident in the life of David, um, where he's hiding out in the cave of Adullam. And the context is this, this is from 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. Um, he's had great success. He's vanquished uh, Israel's enemies. He's you know, defeated Goliath, things like this. And he's getting a lot of public acclaim and notice. And Saul, who is king at this point, uh, becomes very jealous and vengeful. And so he's seeking to kill David. Um, he, 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 is, he does not appreciate the, the fame that uh, David is getting. Um, and so David's out of favor with the king. He's out of favor with the king's uh, uh, cohorts around him. And so David's very isolated at this point. He's had to flee into the wilderness. Um, he's not a part of the prevailing cultural climate. David's living in a cave. But even in the cave, God brings people to him. And this shot is uh, actually in En Gedi in Israel, where I visited a few years ago. The cave of Adullam was in a part of Israel that we couldn't get to uh, that year. But you can kind of see caves off to the left and right there. Um, but this was the kind of uh, landscape and situation that was, David was in. And yet, even there, um, God sends people to him. So here's these opening verses of 1 Samuel 22. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. So you see what's going on here? <laughs> so verse one makes perfect sense to us, right? David has fled uh, to this wilderness area. He's hiding out in this cave, the cave of Adullam. When his family hears about it, they rally to him, right? Verse one says his brothers, his father's household, you know, they, they come to him, they rally around him. And I, I think we can anticipate that um, uh, David welcomed them gladly, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you, uh, you know, you're feeling isolated, you're being persecuted, the king is out to kill you. And it's nice to have your family around, right? Nice to have people who are for you and, and love you and understand you. Um, so the, these are people who share David's concerns. Uh, they're on the same page, you know, with him. They have the same values as he has. But then verse two, there's another group of people who comes to David, who come to David when he's in this cave. Um, people who are distressed, in debt, and discontented. And it says it, David becomes captain over them. In other words, he welcomes them as well. These people in distress, debt, and discontented. Um, discontented, literally the Hebrew is bitter of soul. Bitter of soul. Um, so in addition to the healthy, loyal family members, people that David could be comfortable with, there also comes to David people who are distressed, who are messed up, and who are problematic people. Right? This is what I call 3D people. <laughs> it's a little pun going on here because we got these three Ds of distress, debt, and discontent. But also these are not just kind of two-dimensional people. These are three-dimensional people. These are real people that uh, David has to really uh, deal with. So the, the distressed are, are people who things have been going terribly for them. Um, terrible things are, are happening in their lives. Perhaps it's health issues. Um, maybe it's uh, relational problems. Maybe they've been uh, victims in some way. Uh, they've experienced injustice. These are people who lack hope in their lives. Um, and life has beaten them up. Um, those are people who come to David. People in debt... Uh, the, these are people whose circumstances were out of control, that they, they didn't have much materially to offer David or even to take care of themselves. They were in debt to others, so they didn't have freedom um, that those who are debt-free you know, do have. 
the discontent or the bitter of soul are people who um, feel that they've been betrayed, uh, people who are unhappy, who, people who are angry, who are depressed, who are bitter. Just distressed, debt, discontent, 3D people come to David, right? So this is just the kind of people um, you want following you, aren't they? <laughs> Attract, this is an attractive bunch, <laughs> these 3D people, distressed, indebted, and discontent. Um, not really <laughs> attractive people you want following you, not the kind of people you can really build a kingdom with, um, and not the kind of people that you'd really want to build a church with, are they? But what does it say? David becomes captain over them. He, he welcomes them in. He becomes responsible for them. These, these people are the kind of people we saw uh, in Isaiah 58, the, the oppressed, the homeless, and the poor, the, those who are bound um, uh, under some kind of yoke, the hungry and the afflicted, right? Um, it's these kinds of people who are coming to David and who come into our churches, who come to the church, or that the church is to reach out to. Um, and this is exactly the kind of people um, that Jesus builds his church with. We sort of have this mentality that when we are building up the church, we need to find the best people. We need to find the most influential people. Um, we need to find healthy people. Well, certainly we should, but we shouldn't be turning away or not seeking out um, those who are unhealthy those who are uh, distressed, debt, and discontented, because that's the kind of people um, through whom Jesus builds his church. Back in the 90s, there was uh, a church growth movement in this country, and they were doing a lot of thinking about how do we grow churches. Um, and the proposal was put out there that of what was called the homogenous unit principle. <laughs> and it basically said, that people naturally congregate with people like themselves, right? That makes sense. You, you join a club uh, or, or some activity because that's a group of people that you, that enjoy the same kind of things you enjoy, right? Um, but church growth thinkers were saying, well, that should be applied to the church. Churches should be homogenous. They should be uh, one kind of person, have a particular kind of culture in that church, speaking the same language, have the same interests, same ethnicity, same level of education, same class status, right? Um, the church growth folks were saying, that's how you should build the church. But is that a cave of a Dulum church? I mean, if that, if, if David was operating on the homogenous unit principle, he would have turned away the discontented, um, the distressed, the, the dead, the indebted. Um, what does the Bible say about church life? What, what should the church makeup be? Should it be homogenous or should it be heterogeneous? Heterogeneous, a mix of all different kinds of people. We see in Jesus's life and teaching that he constantly encounters uh, and has a passion for all kinds of people, right? Um, and particularly people who are on the margins, people who are not uh, fancy or whiz bang or have a lot to offer to him. Um, whiz bang, that's a theological term. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jesus encounters and, 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 he's, and he's teaching about having a passion for all kinds of people sickly people, distressed people, people who are under a yoke, uh, and Jesus welcomes them in. He even makes them his most intimate um, disciples. So there's two practical points that come out of this. Two practical points. Who is to be welcomed and who does the welcoming? Who is to be welcomed? Who is to be welcomed? Well, in Matthew 13, 31 and 32, uh, Jesus says this, and he is referencing Ezekiel 17, 22 and 23. Jesus says he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and nest in its branches. 
And what's in all caps is a direct quote from Ezekiel 17. So Jesus says, look, my kingdom is like this small little seed that flourishes up to be a great tree and all kinds of birds come and nest in it. All kinds of birds. Jesus has in mind that all the birds of the air, and, and if you look at the passage in Ezekiel, it actually says birds of every kind. So even if Jesus didn't directly say birds of every kind, he, that's what he's thinking about. Birds of every kind are to come and nest in this tree. Um, Jesus thinks about all different kinds of birds, all different kinds of people should be a part of his kingdom. I, I'm not going to take time to do this, but if you just look at the, the Gospel of Luke, you see quite a variety of people that Jesus encounters, rich and poor. And I'll be sending this PowerPoint to Noel, and he'll put it on the church site so you can look at these verses in your own time. But he encounters rich and poor. He, he ministers to Jews and religious leaders, but also to Romans, to slaves, to Samaritans, um, to women which was pretty radical in Jesus's day, to children, that was also radical, um, to unclean, to sinners and outcasts, you know, people on the margins, um, Jesus is reaching out to, Jesus cares about. And really to sum it up, he makes this statement in chapter 19, verse 10 of Luke, the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He doesn't say the son of man has come to seek and save the slick people, the people who have it all together, right? He comes to save the kind of people who gather at the church of Adullam, 3D people, discontent, debted, distressed. And Paul picks up this idea. You, you can see it in the book of Acts. You see how this is fleshed out as the church begins. But Paul particularly reflects on it in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm not going to take the time to read through this, but just show you the highlights. But I encourage you to look at verses 11 through 22 of Ephesians 2. It's just a beautiful, powerful passage where, as he talks about unbelievers of different ethnicities than the Jewish people, of different backgrounds being brought into the church, um, people who are even former enemies, um, he uses this language of you who are far off have now been brought near, brought into fellowship. Um, and, and he talks about the church being this house that's being built together and we are living stones. So it's this idea of the homeless now have a home with one another in Christ. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful passage. So who's welcomed into the church? Who should be welcomed into the cave of Adullam? church everyone right mm -hmm. everyone everyone should be welcomed um there's not a particular kind of per person we're going after we're not going to be a homogenous church we're going to welcome uh people of all different backgrounds all different uh perspectives all, all, all different places they're coming from all different um sets of needs um everyone should be invited into the cave of Adulam, into the church then who is to do this welcoming? Who, who serves? Who reaches out um, to the world? And, and I really want to emphasize this. I'm not really talking about this today. I, I think I will next month. Um, but a church doesn't just sit there and wait for people to come to it. A good, healthy church is going out and reaching people, just like Jesus did. It goes out among the people, right? Um, and we seek to win them to Christ. We seek to bring them into the life of the church where they can find healing and help. Um, so who's, who's to do that? Who's to serve? Who's to reach out? Who reaches the lost? Who extends the cave of Adullam uh, invitation? Who serves the 3D you know, people? Well, really, anyone who's a follower of Jesus. And there was an interesting study done some years ago um, to see, you know, what was it that drew people to, to come into the life of the church? Like if they, particularly if they visited one Sunday, what would cause them to come back? And if the pastor followed up with them, 3% would come back again. Now, that may be surprising because we I assume, well, that's the pastor's job, right? That's the leadership's job is to go after people, you know, go after the visitors. Um, but you know what? The visitors know that too. And they tend to dismiss you that way. I mean, I, I actually had uh, and this was actually a woman uh, in our church 
And I was, when I was a church, I was pastoring some years ago and I was visiting her. I was, you know, doing some visitation. I stopped by to see her and she says, Oh, it's so nice of you to come by. But of course you have to do that. That's your job. <laughs> so the pastor following up actually doesn't have that much impact, but if there's like a welcoming committee in the church, if there's a group of people who've been designated to do outreach, they're much more likely to come back. But what is the most likely reason for that for a person to come back into the life of the church is when people reach out to them who have no specific responsibility for following up with visitors. Right? I, I think it's just really fascinating. Um, I mean, you think of it this way. If I ask you who planted the church at Rome, right? Who planted the church at Rome? Now you might say Paul, but if you read the letter to the Romans, he says in that letter, I've long been wanting to visit you. I haven't gotten there yet. I hope to get there. Of course, he does eventually get there, not quite the way he expected. But <laughs> um, so Paul, the church already existed. Paul knew people there. He knew some people because he'd met them in other places. Um, and you might say, Peter, there's kind of an old tradition. Uh, but really, there's no evidence that Peter started the church in Rome. Um, we think he died in Rome. Uh, but probably the church was there before he got there. So here's the thing. One of the most important churches in Christendom, the church in Rome, was started by we don't know who, by ordinary Christians, right? By ordinary Christians gossiping the gospel, you know, reaching out and serving 3D people. Um, that's who started the church at Rome. People, people like you and me. Um, so who does the welcoming who serves and who reaches out the answer again is everyone everyone should do that everyone should do that so you know having said this having if we understand okay we're to be a church of a doulum kind of church um, that welcomes all kinds of people healthy people and unhealthy people what kind of church is that going to get us what's the result of seeking to be the church of a doulum <laughs> The result is this, it's messy, it's messy. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you right up front, it's messy. If you're going to have distressed, debted, discontent people in your midst, that's gonna be messy. If, if you want a nice, clean as a whistle, no problems church, Probably you're only going to find that by meeting with yourself. But uh, <laughs> um, you know you can you can go the homogenous route. You know just people who are exactly like you. But that's not real church life. That's not real church life. Jesus wants us to have messy church life, and and that's okay. It's messy. It's challenging, but it's the right thing to do. David didn't send those people away. He became the captain of them. He saw them, he welcomed them, he integrated them into his following, and he integrated them in uh, with those who were members of his family who were like-minded with him. Um, real church life is messy. Real church life is messy, and we shouldn't be surprised by that, and it just causes us to cast ourselves upon the Lord's strength and not our own all the more. I, I talked some years ago with a, a friend who's in missions. Uh, he's, he's ministering in a uh, Muslim country. And uh, he was talking about how forming a missionary team, you, you take some time to evaluate people. They get training, but you're also looking for the dynamics of the team and that you could dismiss people. You know, that he, he had dismissed people. He said, you're not really a good fit for our team. Um, and he could do that. He could keep whoever he wanted. He could dismiss whoever he wanted. Who you know, and keep those who shared the vision, who had the same goals, who were on the same page. Now that may be okay for a mission or maybe a particular project a church is doing, but that's not the way church life works. You can't dismiss people, even though unfortunately historically churches have done that from time to time. But you can't just say you know, we don't really like your kind. Go go away here. You're too much trouble for us. Go away. Um, that's not church life. Church should be a place of refuge for many. 
many who are damaged, many who can't deal with the world, many who are unattractive. But nonetheless, again, these are the kinds of people uh, that Jesus builds his church with. David took responsibility for 3D birds of different feathers, and so also the church needs to take responsibility for 3D people, the unattractive of this world, the distressed, those who aren't able to offer much, um, even those who are bitter of soul. So what kind of church? Uh, you know, of course, I, I've got a picture of a church building here, and I hope you all know, I'm sure you all know, uh, the church is not the building, right? Church is not the building. The church is the people. Church is the people. There's the people. Um, buildings just serve us or, or burden us, <laughs> depending. Um, but what, so what kind, of, what kind of church should we, we be? What kind of people um, should we be? Uh, in light of the cave of Adullam, what, what kind of people, what kind of church um, should we be? And, and let me share with you just one example. And I think I've shared this with um, uh, the church here before, but it's definitely worth looking at again. Um, this is the welcome statement at Coventry Cathedral in Coventry, England. Um, now, I'll just say, I, I don't know exactly where this church is coming from theologically or whatever, but I love this statement. I love this statement. Look at what they say. We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, widowed, straight, gay, confused, well-heeled, or down at the heel. We especially welcome wailing babies and excited toddlers. We welcome you whether you can sing like Pavarotti or just growl quietly to yourself. <laughs> you're welcome here if you're just browsing, just woken up, or just got out of prison. We don't care if you're more Christian than the Archbishop of Canterbury or haven't been to church since Christmas 10 years ago. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet and to teenagers who are growing up too fast. We welcome keep fit moms, football dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, vegetarians, junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery or still addicted. We welcome you if you're having problems or down in the dumps or don't like organized religion. We're not that keen on it either. We <laughs> offer welcome to those who think the earth is flat, work too hard, don't work, can't spell, or are here because granny is visiting and wanted to come to the cathedral. We welcome those who are inked, pierced, both or neither. We offer a special welcome to those uh, who could use a prayer right now had religion shoved down their throats as kids or got lost on the ring road and wound up here by mistake. We welcome pilgrims, tourists, seekers, doubters, and you. Isn't that a great statement? <laughs> I just think that is a wonderful uh, statement. Um, doesn't mean you know, that they're endorsing everything that those people they've mentioned represent. It's saying you're welcome here. We want you to come in to hear the good news we, we want to love on you. We want to serve you um, because we're called to serve all, to welcome all, to disciple all. God and his people welcome everybody. There, there's nothing you have to perform to earn God's attention and shouldn't have to earn our attention. Christians in the church, we're, we're called to serve everybody, to welcome everybody, to disciple everybody, to, to minister uh, and care about um, everyone. So who are the Isaiah 58 people? Who are the Cave of Adullam people? Who are those needy, oppressed, distressed, hungry, bound, homeless, poor, debt burdened, stranger or alien, immigrant, naked, afflicted, discontent that we should be serving? Everybody. Everybody. And, and, you know, in each church situation, we have to evaluate who, who's around us, who's in my life personally, who's, who's, uh, who's, who's God calling the church to reach out to. It, it should be those who are like us and those not like us, right? They're going to be those who are like us that we're fairly comfortable with, who are still needy or discontent or debt burdened, you know, um, and certainly there are going to be people who are not like us, who are afflicted, who are naked, who are hungry. Um, 
you know, people who we're at ease with and people that make us uncomfortable. That's who we should be welcoming in. People that are attractive and people that are unattractive. Oh, oops, people, <laughs> sorry, that didn't line up right. People that love us and even people that hate us, right? Jesus calls us to love those even who are our enemies and who hate us. People that are grateful and people that are ungrateful. In other words, birds of the same feather and birds of different feathers. We should be welcoming into our mess and reaching out to. The world is full of people who have been beaten up by life, who've been betrayed and exploited, who've been robbed of joy and robbed of necessities in life, robbed of truth in their life and left on the side of the road for dead. The church is to welcome uh, like Jesus does. And we're to welcome like David did at the cave of Adullam with indiscriminate love, <laughs> indiscriminate love. In other words, we're, we're not going to discriminate against you um, or discriminate you out of our concern um, because you're different or because you're difficult. Um, we're going to love uh, everyone. The church is to be like the cave uh, of Adullam, um, seeking and welcoming people in uh, uh, of all kinds, uh, uh, the poor, the rich, the weak, the strong, the healthy, the sick, um, righteous people, sinners, right? We're to welcome all, all ethnicities, all nationalities, all backgrounds. Civilized and barbarian, as the, the New Testament writers would say. We are to seek them and welcome them and bring them into the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Um, the Church of Adullam should be a community of refuge for the discontent, for those uh, bitter in their souls, for those who are struggling with the circumstances of life or indebted. Um, the church should seek out and welcome 3D people. And Church of Adullam should be a community where strong and weak and messed up are sought out and welcomed in um, to find God, where there's that outward look uh, going on, where people can find fellowship, can find acceptance, can find love and caring, um, and also where they can find a job to do. I, I, it's very important that churches help people to um, put their hands to ministry and, and to turn their gaze outward as well. Um, Christians should be like David, like Jesus, like Paul. The church should be the church of the Dulem, um, where people encounter, if I plant another church, I think I'm gonna call it the church of the Dulem, um, <laughs> where people encounter a radical love that's like nothing else on earth and where they find a welcome into a community of people where the Lord and love um, is to be found. The church should be the church of the Dulem, the, the 3D church, the church of the good shepherd king, where the kingdom of the Lord is found and goes forth, and God is glorified. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I, we thank you for the example in David's life. And we thank you for, Jesus, what you showed us as you walked the earth, what you taught us. We thank you for uh, Paul and his teaching. Lord, we ask that you would help us to look outward, um, to be Church of Adullam people on an individual basis and, and as a church. Open our eyes to the 3D people around us. Help us, uh, even when it's uncomfortable, um, to step forward and reach out to others. Help us to minister the love of Christ indiscriminately to all around us. We ask it in your name, Lord. Amen.